Walker Cross. It's good to be with you this morning as we uh, celebrate. We've got a lot to celebrate today. It's uh, good to have the St. Marshall Orchestra playing uh, during worship today. We're going to be celebrating our confirmands uh, a little bit later in the service, and so it is uh, certainly a day when we rejoice. I want to welcome those who, of you who might be guests with us today. I know there are some of you who are here uh, to support the confirmation class. And uh, so it's good to, to be with you as we worship. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able, and we'll join together in our call to worship, which is printed on the front of your bulletin, or you can follow along on the screen. In Jesus Christ, there is a new creation. The newness is from God, who has reconciled us through Jesus Christ. If you would remain standing, we'll sing the first five hymns. This is a very fast hymn. We'll sing the first five stanzas of hymn number 57, Over a Thousand Tongues to Sing. The first five stanzas, not the first five hymns. Nice. In case you're trying to reconcile the bulletin with the person standing in front of you, I'm not Cecil. Cecil's not feeling well this morning. My name is John Flora, and I'm happy to try to substitute for him. Let us pray. God of steadfast love and mercy, remind us once again that in Jesus Christ everything has become new. For far too often, Things seem as they have always been. Old habits die hard. Difficult situations linger. Failures from our past linger. We look for your promise, newness, but cannot see it. Speak to us again of your new creation. Open our eyes to its presence in our lives. Call us forth to claim this newness that we may be healed and made whole. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please greet those nearby you in peace.
It is good once again to welcome you this morning to this time of worship. I'd like to invite uh, all of you, if you are at the end of the row, if you could take those blue pads and sign them and pass those down the row, just to let you, us know you're there. But also, uh, if, if you have any pastoral needs or prayer concerns, there's a place to uh, mark those. Or you can go online at stmarshcrummel.org slash attend, and you can mark your attendance there or ask for uh, a prayer. If you have any prayer needs or a message, uh, you can do that as well. We do have a couple of things coming up I'd like to uh, remind you of. Uh, on April 16th, we'll be having our Easter brunch egg hunt. And so we'll meet at 10 for the uh, pitch-in brunch in Wesley Hall. And then 11 a.m. we'll be at Easter egg hunt in the yard behind the church. There'll be separate areas for different ages. There'll be prizes. The Easter bunny will make an appearance. And, and most importantly, the Easter story will be shared uh, during that time. There is something, though, for you to do now, and that is, first of all, invite the young folks in your lives, but also we want to make a request for donations of wrapped candy, small toys, toys stickers, and treats, uh, and there's a bin in the entryway, and we need those by April 1, so later on this week, so I want to invite you to share in that way. Also, uh, today at 3, we'll be having a forum uh, to kind of catch people up on what's going on in the United Methodist Church. There have been a few things at the denominational level that have been happening. We want to give you a chance to, to uh, know what those are and ask any questions. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, and we'll mention later about United Methodist Committee on Relief, it's UMCOR Sunday, but if you want to give to uh, relief to Ukraine, you can mark that on, your, on an envelope, put it in the offering. We are going to pass the offering plate this morning, our first time since pre-COVID, so <laughs> it's a new thing. And, uh, and so uh, d you can put that in the offering plate, or you can, again, go online and, and go to stmarcarmel.org slash give and uh, give electronically there as well. As always, uh, I, I want to give you, you know, I encourage you to look at the blue center section of the bulletin. There are lots of, of activities coming up and studies, mission opportunities, and so you'll want to read that carefully and, uh, uh, you know, appro respond appropriately uh, online. I think that's all of the announcements. Later on, we're going to share uh, part of our confirmation experience. Uh, they did the membership vows during the 940 service, but we'll be uh, kind of uh, affirming their entry into the church a little later. So they're over here on my right. I, I, I figured out in between the service that I'm, I'm finishing my ninth year here. So these confirmands were five years old when I came here. So like many of you, I've gotten to watch them grow into the young adults that they are, and so it's exciting to uh, launch them into this next part of their faith journey. So um, at this time, I think that we have a special connection spotlight about Fletcher Place Community Center. Fletcher Place Community Center, located on the southeast side of Indianapolis, was established in 1872. This year, they celebrate their 150th year of helping to ease the burden of their low-income and homeless neighbors. They provide a clothing thrift store, providing hygiene and household items. They have a food pantry, a community garden. They serve hot meals. They have a senior bingo night and other social services. St. Mark's has been a longtime partner with Fletcher Place by donating oatmeal year-round, food pantry necessities, and each Christmas we collect gifts for their Christmas program in which families receive clothing, toys, and food for their families to be able to celebrate Christmas at their homes. St. Mark's has also sent volunteers to Fletcher Place for our annual Mission in Action Day, the fun and exciting day where we get out in the community to serve others. At Fletcher Place, we've helped to work on facility improvements, sorting and organizing their donations, and property cleanup. Throughout the pandemic, we've contributed by assembling 
and delivering sack meals and hygiene kits. The youth of St. Mark's have helped with this project during their Club 56 mission camp as well as the confirmation class. Teresa Mills at Fletcher Place will share more about how Fletcher Place impacts the local community. I am Teresa Mills. I work at Fletcher Place Community Center. I am the operations manager, which means I'm over hot meals, food pantry, clothing store, pretty much anything that has to do with this side of the building. So a lot of them don't get that warm, hot meal. Uh, we do the best we can. When the churches do come and cook, uh, we take it straight to them. And we try to make sure that it's hot when they get it. Uh, we have been having to do it out of my car. I load my car up. Sometimes it takes two or three trips. We go to, I go to the camps. Um, we hand the food out to the individuals, which makes their day. I've had them scream and holler because they were so happy. I've had them bawl and cry. You know, it's just a mixture of emotions. Um, and then when I come back through, I always make sure that I stop at these four or five different houses and I make sure they get fed too. They miss being connected with the world because right now they live in, they call it silence. They, the, they said that the environment that they live in, they call silence because no one talks to them. No one has anything to say to them. No one even acknowledges that they exist. Churches made sure it felt like home and they miss that. They miss having that family. And that's one of the biggest things that they're all talking about is they want their family back. The churches, actually, I've seen them sit down and pray with them. I've seen them hug them. I've seen them hold them when they cry. You know, I've seen, um, matter of fact, I do believe it was your guys' church, St. Mark's, that actually sit with a guy out here one time for 35 minutes and the guy wouldn't leave until that guy, the homeless guy, was smiling. And Charlie walked out of here with smiles instead of tears. So that right there, that's an accomplishment, you know? That shows me that we're doing something right. You know, if we can make somebody that feels like nothing, feel like there's somebody, even if it's just for 30 minutes a day, that's an accomplishment. Each month, St. Mark sends a crew to Fletcher Place to cook and serve a hot breakfast. Volunteers meet at St. Mark's in the morning to load up food and supplies and then carpool down to Fletcher Place Community Center together. The team of volunteers cooks eggs and sausage. They slice bread and pastries that we've received from Panera Bread and serve the meal cafeteria style. During the pandemic, while unable to serve in person, the meals were packed in to-go containers once cooked by our volunteers. They were then delivered by the Fletcher Place staff to nearby homeless camps and other shelter areas where they knew they could find their residents in need. We are so looking forward to being able to serve breakfast in person once again to their community. Trisha Stanner will now share about her experiences as a longtime volunteer at Fletcher Place. So what has driven me to do this is also to get to know these people because like I say on the drive down and the drive back it's that's a small group. You you talk um, with people, you get to know them as people, you find out other things that they do in the church or outside the church. Um, there's also what I call fellowship time, a little bit of downtime, sometimes uh, serving, you know, when everything is all ready and then we're waiting for the oatmeal to, to be ready and then we're ready to serve, you know, you just get to know everybody. So that's also, I think, what's kind of driven me. But I guess maybe the third thing is I like to know the, um, the missions that we support. So I said, hey, Fletcher Place is one of the missions that we support. Well, where is it? Well, it's downtown Minneapolis. Well, where? You know, and so driving down here, I think, kind of helps to drive a little bit more that the people that we serve live in this neighborhood. So you actually know and get to know some of the people. And I will say, because I also do Roberts Park, there are a few faces that I recognize both places. I always say that I get probably more out of it. I think a lot of us who do mission work find out we get more out of it th than they do. But um, you, know, you put a smile on somebody's face, you had a quick little conversation, just knowing that hopefully they had another hot meal. You are invited to be a part of how St. Mark's supports the mission of Fletcher Place Community Center. You can get involved in a variety of ways. You can sign up to help cook and serve the monthly hot breakfast. There's a sign up sheet for this either in the gathering area or you can sign up online at stmarkscarmel.org slash signups. You can purchase items to help stock their food pantry. There's a grocery list on the connection table in the 
the gathering area to see the list of their greatest needs. This also includes oatmeal year-round. You can support Fletcher Place financially by using one of the mission envelopes in your bulletin or online at stmarkscarmel.org slash give. You can also pray for the ministry of Fletcher Place Community Center and the neighbors whom they serve. Opportunities for you all to connect um, with the activities um, here at St. Mark's. So the Connection Spotlight um, is, as you saw, I was featuring um, Fletcher Place. And the goal of these Connection Spotlights is really threefold. First of all, um, we want to inform you about the many ways that you can get involved at St. Mark's, in particular here this morning with Fletcher Place. Um, and how we've partnered with them in supporting the needs of the community surrounding Fletcher Place. Second, it's to celebrate. It's to celebrate the many ways that um, so many of you have um, given financially, donated items, um, given your time in person to the mission of Fletcher Place, so we thank you for that. And lastly, it's to invite you to participate. Um, we invite you to be a part of the work that's being done at Fletcher Place and, and consider um, maybe being a part of this as the way that we, um, as Jesus has called us to love our neighbors. So I invite you after the service to um, stop at the connection table in the gathering area. Our missions coordinator, Stephanie Cohen, will be out there. She will answer your questions. And um, if you feel called, so called to um, serve breakfast or donate items, um, we'd love for you to participate. And just a last word of thanks. I want to thank Ryan Howe in the AV booth who um, lend his, lended his expertise in creating the video. So thank you. Our New Testament reading this morning is from, <clears throat> excuse me, the fifth chapter of St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, verses 16 through 21. If you'd like to follow along, you can pick up your pew Bible and it'll be in the back on page 181. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. At this time, I would like to invite us to a time of prayer. And uh, as is our custom, we'll begin with a time of silent prayer in which we offer our prayers to God and we invite God to speak into our hearts and minds and then I will lead us in a pastoral prayer. So let us be in silent prayer together. Holy God, we pray for the church throughout the world that all Christians may embody the reconciling love of Christ. We pray for the nations of the world and its leaders 
that all may dwell in peace and that justice may be tempered by mercy. For the planet Earth, we pray, O God, your gift to humankind, that all may share wisely its resources and conserve its riches for our children's children. We pray for our enemies, that we may regard them with the reconciling love made manifest in Christ. We pray for those who are sick or in trouble, for the defenseless, the weak, and the poor, that they may be restored to wholeness of life and livelihood. We pray for the lost, for those who have abandoned God, friends, or family, and for those who have never known such love, that they may come to know the joy of love's embrace. Loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world and our Savior Jesus Christ, through whom we pray and whose words we pray together as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission focus for March is Family Promise of Greater Indianapolis, a nonprofit organization founded in 1994 in response to the crisis of families who are homeless. Programs including the Interfaith Hospitality Network, or IHN, the Apartment Shelter Program and Diversion Program have helped provide emergency food and shelter. These in the aftercare program offer skill development and rehabilitation, working toward economic stability to end homelessness for the families they serve. Today is UMCOR Sunday, one of the special Sundays of the United Methodist Church. This special offering helps UMCOR respond to the to, to United States and international disasters, addresses diseases and poverty, assists refugees and immigrants, provides clean water and works to reduce hunger. They would be unable to do this without your support. Financial donations to both of these missions may be given using the designated mission offering envelope in your bulletin or online at stmarkscarmel.org slash give. Because you give, St. Mark's gives. Let us pray. Long-suffering God, we hear the words of the familiar parable and, at different times, see ourselves as either son. We have received, or demanded, blessings to which we are not entitled and squandered them in self-indulgent living. We have also look, looked out for, from our place of superiority and favor and have, and have been indigent over your lavish dispensing of love and mercy. As we bring our, our gifts today, we do so in the humble gratitude and recognition that any and all blessings in our lives come as your gift of grace. We pray in the name of your greatest gift, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen.
going to give the orchestra just a moment. They've already heard the sermon once. They probably don't need to hear it again. <laughs> I would invite you to stand as you're able as we hear this morning's gospel lesson, which comes from Luke chapter 15 verses 1 through 3 and then 11 through 13. So we're going to read kind of the beginning of the chapter and then the story of the prodigal son, which is, I'm sure, uh, very familiar to, to many of you. Let us hear these words from the Gospel of Luke. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Jesus continued, there was a man, or not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this morning, we are reading from a chapter in Luke chapter 15, which many uh, biblical students call the, the chapter of lost things. And so there's really a series of lost things here, although uh, when it comes to art and literature, probably the prodigal son has occupied the most attention. And as we think about irreconcilable differences, what it means to be reconciled to God and one another, and John read from 2 Corinthians, which talked a lot about being reconciled to God and to each other, we think about what does it mean to be lost, people of God, to be found by God's great grace. So in the beginning of this story, Jesus is uh, teaching, and some of the uh, 
leaders of the synagogue, the Pharisees and other leaders, are complaining because he has welcomed in people that they don't think he should have welcomed. That he's, invi- he's had lunch with tax collectors, he's, he's eaten with, with what they describe as sinners and, and people who are marginalized in their society. And so they've, they've said, you are not keeping the correct company. And so Jesus tells these stories in response to that criticism. And he tells a series of three stories. The first one is the story of a lost coin. This is about a woman who is uh, at home. She has a, a single coin. She has lost it, and she is now trying to find it. And so she scours her home in order to find this single coin that she has lost. Now, these stories kind of escalate Because in the first case, we have a coin. A coin has no capacity to lose itself, even if we might blame the coin occasionally. How many of you have ever lost your keys? They don't lose themselves. A coin cannot lose itself. In the second story, he's talking about sheep, which have some capacity to lose themselves, but don't have self-awareness. You know, you know what I mean? So it's kind of up the scale from a coin, but not quite to a person. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the final story about the prodigal son. So in this first story, a coin has been lost. The woman sweeps. She, she finally finds the coin, and she is overjoyed, and she throws a, a party for her friends to celebrate the fact that she's found this, uh, this coin. Now, Obviously, this is kind of literary hyperbole. You wouldn't throw a party that probably costs more than a coin to celebrate the fact that you found a coin. But Jesus is trying to make a point. He says here, and, and part of the point is that a, coin, a single coin probably isn't that valuable, much like his critics think of the people with whom he keeps company. But to Jesus, not only are they valuable, they are worth celebrating. They are things of great value. And so he, he makes this contract so as he's trying to make a point to his critics. And so we move from this story uh, in which uh, this, this has no capacity. And we, we recognize that we are not like coins. We, in fact, have the capacity to get lost to thwart the will of God. A few years ago, I heard the story of a woman who had eight children, and I'm sure there were plenty of stories in this house, but the one I heard was that she was next door to a neighbor. She came back home, and she looked in the living room, uh, the window, just to kind of see how the children were doing, and the the five youngest children were kind of in a circle around something on the living room floor. And she thought, I wonder what's going on. She goes in the house, and she looks, and here are these five children. They have somehow managed to find uh, a, a group of baby skunks, and they have these baby skunks in the middle of the living room, and they're playing with them. So in order to rescue her children, she immediately screams, quick, run. Each child pick up, picked up a baby skunk and ran. Which is about our response sometimes because God has, uh, you know, God is saying, uh, you know, I'm trying to look out for you, but we we hold on to those things that uh, are our are, are sins, are, are, uh, the ways that we disobey God. We, we hold on to those things rather than dropping them and running when maybe we should do that. In the second story, Jesus tells about a flock of sheep, which was a very common sight and still is a common sight in Israel today, and, uh, but it's not very much a common sight in uh, in, the, in Carmel, Indiana. I can't remember the last time I've seen a flock of sheep uh, running around town. But in the, in the story about the flock of sheep, he, he tells about, you know, one of them gets lost. Then sheep don't really get up in the morning and say, I think I'll get lost today. But they do kind of see uh, something, a piece of grass, something that looks tasty, and they follow that, and then they see something else, and they, they get distracted, and before they know it, they're lost, and, th- and they have very little capacity to get back found, uh, and so uh, Jesus tells a story about if, if a sheep is lost, you have to go find them, and, and once you find them, you celebrate. Uh, 
Many of you know, in October, my wife Michelle and I went to Ireland, and uh, one of the things that you see in, in Ireland, we've been to Ireland and Scotland, and they're both countries where there are more sheep than there are people, so a little, little different than Indiana. But if you see sheep in the fields, a lot of times you'll see uh, it's like a little rainbow of sheep there. You know, there there are sheep with different that have their wool dyed different colors, and um, and I'll tell you that those are they are non toxic dyes. So no sheep were harmed in the creating of this sermon. <laughs> but they they are, have different dyes on them because each shepherd kind of dyes their own sheep a different color so that they can separate out the herds if they graze in the same pasture as another flock of sheep, which is not uncommon. In Jesus' time, that would also happen. The sheep would graze together. They would, they would get commingled with somebody else's flock of sheep. But in that culture, what they would do is the shepherds would separate themselves, and then they would call their sheep, and their sheep knew their voice and their name, and the sheep would separate to their shepherd. Jesus uses that image in, in uh, another story about this. But here, he's talking about the, the celebration of this one sheep that is lost. And so it's a coin, then a sheep. And finally, we come to the story of the lost son. There are really several char- characters in this story, particularly the two sons and the father. And so this son comes, he asks for his, his inheritance, his dad cashes out part of his 401k and, and sends him into a foreign land. And he, he spends out, you know, part of the dad's retirement money. And then he is there and he is feeding the pigs in a foreign country. And, and pork is, is not a clean uh, meat for Jews to eat. It's non-kosher. So not only is he feeding this animal that is non-kosher, which would make him unclean ceremonially, not that he's worried too much about that at this point, but he is feeding them this slop, because, you know, we call it slopping the pigs, and he is thinking to himself, I, I'm so hungry, I would eat this food that I'm feeding to the pigs right now. Now, that's, that's a low moment. That's when you, he says, I think I should go home. And so he decides to go home. And he has, he is, as he's traveling home, he's rehearsing in his mind what he's going to tell his dad. How many of you have ever had conversations you're anticipating and you start saying, I'm going to go over my mind what I'm going to say so I don't forget to say everything that I need to say? Yeah, I see some hands. So uh, we've got some people can testify to that. So, you, so he's rehearsing his story. Dad, I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be your son, but, you know, and he's, he's got this whole spiel down, several lines of it that we get in, in this gospel. And he gets home, and there is what is one of the most poignant moments in the New Testament where he arrives his father clearly is sitting on the front porch waiting for him to come home, watching for him, because before he even gets close to the house, the father runs out, gives him a big hug. The son gets out the first line of his, of his spiel that he's memorized, just the first line, and then uh, before he gets to the point where I, I, I would gladly be a slave in your house, the dad, he's, he's already... it's. It's, it's good. It's all good. And he says, let's have a party. You're home. You're, you're back in grace. And he gets a robe and a ring and, and the calf, fatted calf. And if one of us were writing this story, we would probably end it there. But let's go back to verses 1 through 3, where it begins the story by saying, Jesus is teaching and the leaders of the synagogue are criticizing him because he's welcoming people into his fellowship. And so the story continues with the elder brother. And the dad is having the party and the elder brother's outside and he's pouting. I, I don't think the word pouting is in the King James version of this story, but that's what's happening. He is outside having a good pout. And the dad comes out and he says, son, we're having a party. Why don't you come in? And he said, you know, that's not fair. You know, you, you, I've been working for you all these years and you didn't 
throw a party for me or my friends anytime, and now he comes home and you kill the fatted calf, you throw a party. In other words, you're welcoming someone into your house that I don't think you should welcome into your house. Does this sound familiar to the words that the Pharisees are telling Jesus? And the dad says, listen, you know, I, you've been with me always, and I'm glad that you're with me, and I celebrate you've been with me, but we need to have a party. This, this child of mine who, is, who I thought I had lost has now come home, and I want to celebrate. Now, I wonder if the Pharisees heard the message. In my optimistic times, I think that maybe they did hear that message. Maybe some of them heard it and didn't like it. Where, where they're saying, you're still, you're welcoming people. We don't think you should be welcoming. But here are these stories of lost things and about homecoming. And part of our role as the church is to, to welcome people home, to have a party, to celebrate new members and new acts of faith, and to say, good job. You guys have done great, and we're, we're proud of you, and we celebrate you. A few years ago, people, someone gave me a, a copy of a book called Traveling Mercies by Anne Lamott. It was one of now many books by Anne Lamott that I have read. But in the book Traveling Mercies, Anne Lamott tells a story about her church in Sausalito, California. It's a small inner city church. And particularly, she tells a story about her pastor, who as a young girl you know, living in an inner city, got lost one day. She was probably about seven or eight, and she got lost. And she's wandering the streets, trying to find her way home. And a policeman stops and he says, do you need some help? And she said, yes, I need help. I can't find my way home. And he, he puts her in the, the squad car and he begins driving around the neighborhood. And he says, you know, let me know when you see your home. And they're driving around for a little bit. And finally, she sees the steeple of a church. And she says, that's the steeple of my church. If you take me to the church, I can find my way home. I always know how to find my way home from church. I hope that people know how to find their way home from this congregation, from this church, that, that part of our role as a congregation is to, to help people come home to God and to celebrate that divine homecoming. Some of our friends are lost, but they can be found, and they can be rejoined with God's great household. But we have to welcome them, and we have to help them find their way home. This morning, I celebrate our confirmands as they affirm this as their church home, as they think about what it means to be a child of God, and we want to celebrate them. We want to affirm the decisions that they've made and, uh, and to pray uh, God's blessing upon them. And so at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Julia to come forward. They have already, as I mentioned in the first uh, worship service, uh, had had their vows, and so we as a congregation will respond to them and to affirm this, them today. So I'm going to ask the confirmants to stand, and I'm going to ask you to face the congregation because they're going to be uh, affirming you uh, by their words. So I want to ask you, and there's a bulletin insert, so you have this in your bulletin uh, this morning. So I ask you, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. All right. At this time, confirmands, you can turn back around now. You will be invited and introduced one at a time, and at that time, uh, Pastor Brian and I will pray over you, and your mentors and your family members will be invited to come up and pray over you as well.
And then for the congregation, when I say the name of one of these students, if you recognize that name, if you've had them in class, if you know them in the hallways, you are invited to stand up as part of that recognizing that, yes, I know this person, I know their faith, I am proud of them and I will stand for them. Elise Cawthorn. You guys can sit down. Elise, know that you are loved, that you are welcomed into the family of God, that, you are, that your faith is witnessed, and that you are supported and not alone in this journey. May God be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Lucy Cawthorn. Lucy, may you remember that you are dearly loved and that you are welcomed into Christ's body, into the church, that there is always a place for you, for your gifts, for your talents, and that you do not walk this journey alone, but that others will support and love you. These things we ask in God's name. Amen. <laughs> Finn Hilton. Finn, may you be filled with the confidence of the Lord's Spirit. May you be encouraged in your faith journey, in your wisdom, in your growth. May God be with you, and may God guide you. You have come so far, and there is still so much to be discovered. Know that you do not walk this journey alone, but that you are truly loved. In the name of God we pray. Amen. Cameron Petro. Cameron, we pray for you today. We praise God for all that you have done, for all the gifts that God has given you, and for all the gifts that you give to the world. We thank God for the faith that you have shown, for the journey that you are undertaking, and for how far it will take you. Remember that you do not walk this path alone, but that you are supported, you are surrounded, and you are loved. In God's name we pray. Amen. Cole Ragsdale. Cole, may you receive the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, that calls you to love others and to also love yourself in return. May you accept the grace that God has given you and be strengthened in all that you do, knowing that you do not walk this journey alone, but that you are surrounded by a faithful community who will be there for you in the moment. In the name of God's Son, we pray. Amen. Josie Robinson. Holy God, we pray for Josie today that she may be reminded of your great love and grace for her, that she is a part of a family that is bigger than anything she has ever known, that she is part of the body of Christ. Bless and keep her, guide her in her continuing faith journey as we welcome her this day. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the uh, confirmants to stand once again. And again, face the congregation. Sorry, spinning you about just a little bit. And uh, congregation, I'm going to ask you to uh, respond as we welcome these members of the household of God. I commend these persons to your love and your care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, 
and perfect them in love. If you would, uh, join together in the congregational response. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. And we welcome you. Give our service and witness that everything. And so we want to thank God for this class. We want to celebrate. We, we have uh, uh, kind of a little reception for uh, out in the uh, gathering area. But for now, let us offer our joy and thanks to God. So I'd like to invite everyone to stand as we sing our closing hymn, softly and tenderly. Let's sing just the first and the last stanzas, just the first and the last stanzas of softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus. celebrate together the great homecoming that we have in Christ Jesus, and let us invite others home to be part of the family of God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.